Festival. And before I introduce our panelists, I just want to thank a and &E Indie Films for sponsoring this space for conversation, and also to Junior Johnson, um, Midnight Moon, who's responsible for the libations we have in the back to keep the conversation flowing. Um, so we had a number of films this year that I felt like dealt with history and archival footage, intense research in innovative ways, um, and uh, felt worth having a conversation with some of the, the makers of these works. So Nancy Bursky has agreed to moderate the conversation. Nancy's film, Afternoon of a Fawn, is um, screening at the festival this evening. And um, her film, The Loving Story, screened at Full Frame a couple of years ago. Shala Lynch has been to the festival a number of times. Um, her film, Chisholm 72, screened a couple of years back. And last year, um, we screened Free Angela and All Political Prisoners. Um, Cindy Redeen is here with Freedom Summer, which is Stanley Nelson's latest film. And then Mark Samuels is the executive producer of American Experience. So it's quite a great collection of guests, and we look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, before we start discussing things here on the stage, I wanted to know how many people in the audience are either working on or have made films that deal with history. Great. I had a feeling that might be the case. So any questions that I put to our panelists or we end up discussing in general, I just want you to feel like those questions are being put to you as well. And, and you can absolutely join in at any time. Obviously raise your hands. We don't want a free-for-all, but <laughs> um, please be, feel like you're part of this conversation. We want to hear from you as well as the people on the panel. Um, I thought that Sadie's idea to do this panel was an excellent one. Um, I, I have been struck not only working in the documentary area and working on two films that were historical films, but also screening as many as I have over the years, either at full frame or um, in ver the very recent past, on how fresh history has become in the documentary world. Um, history of all the genres in documentary, I should say maybe a subset, a subgenre, could potentially be the stalest because it's often material and content that we're familiar with. And indeed, a lot of the same images and footage tends to crop up in documentaries in the past. I would see that happen quite a bit when I was uh, working at Phil Frame. Um, but I, I, I can't tell you how exciting I've found the most recent films that I've seen to be. Um, and when I say recent, I stretch that term a little bit because sh um, Shola's films are a couple of years old. Angela was um, shown at last year's festival and then um, the Shirley Chisholm film was shown, how many years ago was that? Uh, 2004. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, the other two films, two other films that we're, we're kind of invoking today are films that you're involved in, Freedom Summer and Mark, um, Last Days of Vietnam. I mean, you're actually, y I mean, Mark is executive producer um, of American Experience, and um, I think both of them are American Experience films, correct? Um, and in both of those cases, um, Freedom Summer and Last Days of Vietnam, I was fascinated by the fact that these are not sweeping documents of an event, but what they've done is they've carved out a chapter. Instead of looking at the entire civil rights movement or even the movement to register voters overall, the Freedom Summer is literally about a particular summer. And in last days of Vietnam, instead of the entire war or the, the politics of the war, um, this is about the withdrawal from the war, the exodus from Vietnam. And in both cases, there was footage that I had never seen before. Um, having looked at a lot of documentaries, they were, it was so fresh and so, uh, so vibrant. And so I guess what I'd like to do is put to you two first, tell us about the process of finding that footage and what made it so fresh. You want to start? Cindy, you want to start? Cindy? Um, well, basically from day one, um, we start looking for archival footage. Um, we did have an archival researcher 
but in addition to her, like reaching out to every known archive, every state archive in Mississippi, every southern archive. Um, we also would ask every individual that we spoke with, you know, do you have home movies? You know, do you remember anyone taking photographs? You know, did you have, you know, were there staff? Your SNCC had um, some people on staff that were taking photographs. So in addition to them, it's like, well, who, who else, you know, was sort of a staff photographer, was taking a lot of photos? Um, so we just kept asking everybody for archival materials. And, and did you have, um, uh, did you have rules for yourself? Did you set a kind of bar for the kind of material that you wanted to use, aside from hoping that you'd uncover new things? Was there anything that you just kind of dictated in terms of what you were going to use and what you weren't going to use? I mean, Stanley's philosophy is get everything. And he means everything. <laughs> so um, he definitely wants to find the undiscovered um, archival materials. Um, but he also wants to look at you know, what has been used in the past or to find out like if there's an image that has been used in the past, well, what was preceded that image or what came after that wasn't used, it would, might have been, you know, just as terrific. Mm -hmm. Mark, how, how about you? Well, um, I'm speaking secondhand because um, Roy Kennedy c unfortunately couldn't be here. But, you know, s sometimes the challenge in history filmmaking is to not follow the archival because the archival is often the story of the winners, the powerful. Good um, point. And so you have to sort of dig around and. In the last days in Vietnam, we had uh, the story of the USS Kirk. It, did anybody see the film? Oh, <laughs> can we just package you guys and <laughs> take you around from festival to it's festival? It's a wonderful <laughs> film. Um, it's really. Anyway, great. that footage or that the story that you hear on the USS Kirk that's told through audio of the officer, which is really dramatic story. Um, you know, it's a challenge when you only have the audio and you think, well, what are we going to show? What are we? How are we going to bring this to life? And believe it or not, I'm sure you've all encountered this, halfway through the making of the film in an interview with an, another member of the Kirk, somebody said, you know, there was a guy, I think he was like a, you know, it's a junior officer, and, you know, he was running around with the Super 8 camera a lot. You know, y you should call him. His name's Mike. And y would you be interested in that? And, it was <laughs> and, the, and Rory was like, of course. And sure enough, this guy had Super 8 footage that had never come out of the can. And you put the two together, and you you found f footage that's never been used before, and I'm sure you have too. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And it's just a godsend. But I think you have to be careful about having it draw you towards you know where there's archival richness, therefore there goes the story. Because yeah. I think a lot of Great times point. it takes you to another place that you don't want to go. Great point. Um, I Michelle, I was going to say uh, just one quick point. When I saw your film last year at the festival, um, having made one film that was very archival heavy and working on another one, I remember suddenly this light bulb went off in my head because you used the, film, the footage so beautifully. And, and I realized that footage, archival footage is a blessing. And it's something that we should cherish. It's not something that's just another tool in making a film, but it's something that we should embrace and really, it's magic. In a way, what we are is we're collage artists. We don't create each image. We look for the images we wish we created. We could we could have created if we had been there at the moment. Um, but I would like to say about researching, I think one of the, so uh, I made a film about Angela Davis. It's not a biography, but about really how this 26-year-old philosophy grad student in 1968 gets catapulted into being an international political icon. So it is kind of a, a micro history, because our lives aren't, don't have dramatic arc, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, the, a lot of the footage came from news organizations. But even in news organizations, um, the stuff that makes the air is what people know about. And then particularly when you're talking about subjects like African Americans, things get shoved into miscellaneous piles. So we had some footage of a Black Panther shootout in LA between the Panthers and the police, et cetera. But we went through every, um, on that date, for that date, we went through every bit of footage. And do you know what? We found people on the sidelines, that's how it was labeled or whatever, Angela Davis, was being interviewed by a reporter on the sidelines. So, and this was part of news footage that had never been labeled properly. So depending on the subject, 
and in particular when you're talking about women and African Americans, we get mislabeled or non-labeled, <laughs> or generally labeled half rows. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. So that there is this unearthing process um, that is so much. The detective work is a lot of fun. Yeah. What did you learn in between the Shirley Chisholm film and the Angela Davis film? Was there something that informed you when you made the Shirley Chisholm film that that I'm sorry that then informed your work on Angela Davis? They're, they're so, the stories are so different. Um, Angela Davis's story is international, so I really related to what you said. I started the research, then we had a director of research, we had a researcher in California, we had two researchers in California, we had a researcher in Germany, and a researcher in France. That there was no way for one person <laughs> to do all of the research mm -hmm. to find the evidence. Does anyone have any questions pertaining to that? Yes. Um, you know, one of the things I think that's um, been a casualty of sort of the economics of uh, documentary production for television has been the time that you have to find stuff. The time you, to find it and then the time to work with it. So on Which the equals end, cost, right? Yeah. 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 And um, it's really hard in many instances. I mean, the, the low-hanging fruit that's in there, you know, the network news reports, the famous footage of, you know, the helicopter landing on what wasn't the embassy, but was, you know, pick up people to take them to the embassy. That comes relatively quickly, and that, and if you only have time for that first skim, that's what you get. Um, it's the next level that Shalos was, was referring to that, um, becomes harder, and, and you have to c try to get some personal footage, and you have to mine um, some different sources. The last um, footage that came in, in when, as we were putting the film together for Last Days in Vietnam, came from uh, either France or Germany or somewhere, you know, and you sometimes have to look that far afield, because, because a, lot, you know, a lot of the cameramen there were from the European countries, and it, um, we didn't have access to that. Then it became, E really hard to get footage of the South Vietnamese because you can't really go to the current government's repository and get go to the archive in Ho Chi Minh City and, and, and mine that. So that became a real challenge, and some of that was personal as well. And so, you know, it's um, it's it's going to be really hard, I think, to make history films um, in 50 years because. Um, I'm not sure that the documentation that we're all doing on our iPhones is going to last. And it's, it's a wonder now how we're, you're going to construct histories in the future uh, out of the digital present. I, it's a real concern. I think that's a good question. By the way, um, if you know you're going to ask a question, come up to the microphone, and if you spontaneously decide you want to ask a question, we'll try to bring the microphone to you. But we're recording this panel, so it would be great if we could get all of this recorded. Um, you know, I think that that is a big concern, um, and I don't know that much about the archival repository situation. Are you aware, or any of you aware, of how what is being done to preserve this archival material? Actually, I know a lot about this. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I am a filmmaker, but I've also become the um, moving image and recorded sound curator. Um, for the Schomburg Center in New York City, Fantastic. which is part of the New York Public Library System. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so it's a kind of great meeting because I love the evidence of us. <laughs> and so now I am part of the public, and the public library has policies around all of these. And it is a b and it is a big concern. And we're starting to do studies and um, informational stuff about how to how to keep the digital um, materials. Um, archived and to collect them. And so now archivists are really becoming digital experts. So you can bring old hard drives, like some in our, in our, our archival retrieval 
unit. You, you, people bring floppy disks and the, all the old technologies. And so what these folks are, are technologically very proficient for mining that content. So all is not lost, but I do think to the point of you can't just put a drive necessarily, like you could a can of film. You, it, it will sustain itself in a particular way. It's, it's a lot more difficult. Um, and so we're going to lose a lot until we catch up the general public catches and, up. And I think one of the problems we find is that many of these repositories are not well funded. Yes. And you have people that are working in them and basically day in and day out dealing with requests. And one of the, Mark's point about the timing is, is critical. You, you might have a deadline, whether it's for a festival or for a delivery to a, to a network. And um, the library just can't turn your request around quickly enough, and it can drive you crazy. I mean, I had this situation with the Performing Arts Division of the New York Public Library, um, where we made requests for a lot of footage, dance footage, and it was there, but we couldn't get it. In fact, we waited months for it, uh, because it had to be digitized, and they're very systematic, and they would only do it in the order that it was requested. And all I can say, my, my, my cautionary note is if you're working on a documentary film, give yourself a, a historical one where you're reliant on archival footage, just give yourself plenty of time, as much as you possibly can. Because even if you discover it, it's not going to be that easy to access it. And then to get the master once you've decided you're going to use it. I mean, the, the State Archive <coughs> in Mississippi has one person yeah. right, who works over their whole collection. And then the way they um, catalog um, one of the people that we ended up interviewing in the film, but when I was pre-interviewing him, he said, oh, I gave my photos of the summer to the archive in Mississippi. I said, that's great, I'll get the photos. Now, his photos were in a collection with his printed materials. So it was actually in manuscripts and not in photographs. So his photos were in the bottom <coughs> of a box under all his paperwork. So it's calling the archive saying, you know, these photos exist. Well, we're not sure. You know, yeah. well, he yeah. tells us they right. exist, right. you know. You know, please open the box. Uh, and, and so that's, that's one extreme, <laughs> exactly, please, uh, please open the box. That's, right, uh, that's right. one extreme yeah. where sometimes uh, there's so much material that the one archivist can't possibly know what's in the collection. But then the other, but you, when you access it, if you, as a producer, give yourself enough time, what is the cost? Compare that to, I think our history is being held hostage by corporate interests. I mean, it sounds dramatic to say yeah. that. Well, go but for it. I mean, you know, when you when you start to talk to these very nice people who are the representatives for Corbis and ABC and NBC and CBS, the actual cost of licensing that material and the research fees are enormous. So in order for us to sustain ourselves and to sustain our work, we're talking about larger and larger budgets. And, and actually, Why are you looking at me? Well, <laughs> I was just going to take because you're you're the only one on that side. Except uh, I'm going to take the onus off. I'm not off blaming of you, Mark, oh. <laughs> but I'm looking at you, man. <laughs> I'm going to take the onus off of PBS because yeah. I had a situation where I needed to They're get good. some really important footage from CBS. And because this is not their stock and trade, it's not their bread and butter, they had one or two people that even knew what to do and what I was talking about. And, and every time I would try to reach them, they weren't available, they were out to lunch, they were on vacation. I mean, it just wasn't important to them. Yeah. And, and so sometimes this is a human function that you know you have to motivate them to say, please, I need you to just tell me it's okay to use this footage. I already had it. I'd gotten from the Paley Center, but I couldn't get the permission to use it. And um, I, I swear that it took four months to get it from CBS. One letter saying it was okay. And that's not long, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, sir. Thanks for this is a great panel so far. Um, I'm a historian, a professional historian who uh, who is in the academy basically, but I've worked on uh, films in collaboration, and I'm struck by the kind of parallel. Obviously, I mean the same kind of thing that you said. It's very powerful. The archive can also hold us hostage. We always have to push against the archive. But I guess I'm curious about new models for collaboration between historians and f documentary filmmakers because this kind of archival work you're doing, obviously we're doing in parallel at the same time. So is it possible to imagine films that are written not af you know not sort of after maybe certain historical narratives are written by academics and then get interpreted, but whether collaboration could be kind of worked into this you know as historians are doing research, especially you know at the Schomburg or other collections, and in in relation to that too, whether collections I mean if if 
public collections or university collections really begin to, to curate audiovisual materials, that will make possible documentary films in the future in a different way, precisely to sort of take it away from some of the corporate interests. I mean, I think of the model of the ENA in France that just requires for all, all this stuff to be deposited. So there's a kind of public face to, to the material that's, that's broadcast. So, so I'm anyway, not sure I totally understand your question. Um, mm -hmm. Or you want to speak to I, it? I, I, it? In a way, when you're making a historical documentary, there's already a collaboration, usually with advisory panels right. and, all, right. and all of that. And in the case of the films that I've made, um, because I came up, I, my interest in filmmaking, I, was a, I have a master's in American history, came to filmmaking because I couldn't get into curating and landed a job with Ken Burns. Mm -hmm. So I got to to work for five years, I think, on um, big, sweeping historical, non-micro histories. <laughs> but I felt lost. Yeah, I didn't see myself, women, people of color. Right, right. So the films that I make actually are original research, right, and right. that they are groundbreaking in that way. That there is no, I didn't. There is no work on right. Shirley Chisholm's run mm -hmm. for president. In fact, it had been completely no ignored as irrelevant by the media at the time and then by academia. Mm -hmm. And even the, the piece on Angela Davis, this is the first time she really talked as openly as she did. Um, and so there is always a way to collaborate mm -hmm. um, in a like-minded way. And one of the things I'd like to do at the Schomburg is get more and more of that collaboration right, going right, right. because it's through the discussion we can reach different audiences. Because sometimes kids will watch a film, but then they, it's a surface medium and they need to go and they need to read the footnotes and the details. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. So, so, yeah, so are sorry. you saying that um, if you're doing research, you're, you would like to somehow connect to a filmmaker at the, at the initiation like of your research process, and see yeah, if there's yeah. a collaboration? Exactly. I think it's a great idea, and I could tell you that documentary filmmakers would love the opportunity mm -hmm. because not that they can't discover stories on their own, but sometimes you will enlighten them, you will reveal something to them that they didn't even realize mm -hmm. was there, and then, um, the I mean th then the making of the film is that much easier for them because right, the collaboration right. is al already there. So I, I don't know how one would get that started, but I guess the first thing to do is do one. Well, we've know? Yeah. done this actually uh, more than a few times. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly enough, uh, the couple of th real more successful times we've done it, we've done it at the behest of the historian okay. who was, uh, had laid out uh, a book topic for a publisher and was having trouble accessing some of the interviewees that they wanted to. But the power of a film being made with it opened up a lot of doors. And so we, we um, collaborated from the galley point on uh, in sort of joint interviews that went simultaneously into the book and into the film. Can you give us an example of some of those? Um, yeah, we, um, our, f our film on, um, it wasn't Kit Carson, it was a film that we did with uh, Hampton Sides right after that. Oh, it was Roads, uh, Roads to Memphis. Um, okay. About the so the simultaneous, which he he wrote a book called Hellhound on My Trail. And it was about the simultaneous paths of Martin Luther King and James Earl Ray into Memphis and uh, how this fateful moment happened. And he was having trouble getting access to some of the luminaries of the Civil Rights Movement as as, because they've told the story 50,000 times, as we all know. <laughs> and it's like there's one more book being written. But well, with the film in tow, he, he was able to get the interviews because as we were filming them. So. I, w I would just add, I think historians also forget about the power of first-hand experience through watching films. You get to report right. and not just rehash. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's my stuff yeah, for no, historians I mean, I, these days. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the motivation is similar. I, uh, the films I've worked on are about Haiti. I write about Haiti. And there's a kind of sense of trying to get counter-narratives, you know, getting things that are, have not been told into the into the space that I think a lot of, especially younger historians, are trying to, to do. So I think there's a kind of, often there's kind of parallel missions in some ways. Um, but then there's also discoveries that are being made, you know, as people are doing new research. I think if historians went in imagining a film being made, they would look, you know, at stuff differently too from the beginning. They would look for mm -hmm. visual materials. So. There's a sense of playing it forward. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you see one documentary and it, it, it triggers an idea for another story within that documentary. That's happened to me once or twice, and I'm just wondering if other people have found that the documentaries themselves become the groundwork for the next chapter. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I had varying experiences with historians. Um, the advisors that were um, <laughs> part of the project were great. Um, they were very open. I could call them up and just, you know, Hey, you know, what do you think should be in the film? And you know, very open and generous. Um, I did call one 
particular female historian and same kind of open-ended question, you know, ex explain PBS documentary, Stanley Nelson, blah, blah, blah. Um, and she's like, I've done a lot of research. I've spent a lot of time. You know, I don't know why you're calling me. If you have two specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. But I don't want to have a free-ranging conversation with you when I've spent five years, eight years of my life. So she was very not willing to <laughs> collaborate. Why are you looking at me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I handed you all these historians, right? <laughs> it, 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 wa it wasn't one of those. It wasn't one of those. Um, hi. I actually have a question. Um, d can you, it's, Shala, you touched on a lot of things that actually are going on currently with the project that I'm working on, on Haiti. Um, and um, I just wanted to know if any of you have can talk a little bit about fair use and if there was an instance where there was a footage that you really like fell in love with and you were caught and you were stuck in that hostage situation that you may have used anyway under that whole fair use category? It, yeah, inadvertently, we've, um, uh, our legal department has become national experts in fair use um, and they've actually written a book. And By necessity, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> in collaboration with um, American University. I yeah. think it, there's a very nice book that you can get. I can't recall the title of pa it. It's but Pat Ofterheist? Yes, yeah, yeah it's, a very, it's a very good book. Fair use is a, li is a little squirrely. It looks like it's real simple. There's just four rules, but, but the interpretation is very gray. And in general, you have to frame things, and you, can, and you can't use things for other purposes other than talking about them as a historical document. But it's a tool that is worth studying and, and um, learning about um, so that you can get access to important material. But you have to be very careful that you're not just borrowing indiscriminately. And there's very strict length um, issues, how, how long you can use copyrighted material, how you have to set it up, go into it, how you come out of it. Um, sometimes, you know, if you want to play it under something, you can't do that because then, it's, then you're actually sort of using it for another purpose. It really has to be front and center, almost like a picture within a frame that you're talking about as a historical document, historical elements. So you can talk about a book that's published. You can talk about a, a song that was written. You can talk about an, a movie that was made that addressed this topic. But you've really got to be talking about the object itself to be able to use it in fair use. You can't just say, I'm going to borrow some great footage from this feature film that's about my topic, and I'm just going to use it, and then I'm going to say it's under fair use. You can't do that. It's, it's a very complicated topic, and we've actually had f um, full panels here just dealing with it with lawyers on the panel. Um, but, so I'm not trying to sidestep it, but um, we could spend probably the rest of the, the panel discussing it. One thing I would add, though, is that um, Fair use can come into play when you can't get the permission that you need and you've done everything you possibly can to track down the owner of that footage or photograph. Um, and I would always advise that you talk to an attorney before you go ahead and decide that it's fair use. But at some point, if you desperately need it and you've just you've documented all your emails and your letters and your phone calls and you still and no one has responded to you, then typically you can use it. Um, but you know, if you have anything more specific to ask, that's great. But I think we should, unfortunately, save this for another panel because it's a great topic. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, I wanted, I wanted to ask a question about the process. Uh, do most of you start with a specific thesis in mind for your film and then look for footage that fits into that? Or do you start with a general topic and let the footage that you find shape your project? I, I always start with the topic and um, uh, some sense of what I think the story is. You, you, ha you have to be open to what the story um, becomes and the film you actually shoot and find. Um, but especially for the research side of it, um, I find that ha very, having very detailed chronologies really helps for certain subjects because those will be the entry point for which you find the material that you need. I've often found that the topic will give me, the, the, the person or the subject will give me a kind of story chill, and I'll get excited about it and start doing the research, but I hold myself back from figuring out what the essence of it is. I let the, the research and, and the evolution of it, which really should, you should give yourself quite a bit of time for that as well. 
um, help you come up with what the meaning is and what you want people to take away from your film. So it's just, it's all part of the process. Uh, we're a little idiosyncratic, perhaps, but um, we, I, because of a, I look at so many topics or so many potential topics uh, across the year in deciding what films we're going to commission, I would say that over time we've actually um, shied away from topics almost completely. Um, when you think about how many biographies you could make in Amer from American history subjects and how many event films you could make in American history subjects and how many thematic programs you could make from American history. It's an, I it's an infinite number. And you say, well, how do you possibly select that down to, to decide the films you make? And if you put on a set of filters that are narrative filters that have require characters and require conflict and, and quite honestly require more than a simplistic thesis but require some complexity, what we call the 360 degree view of history, which is the hardest thing to a attain so that there's not, you know, Good, good people on one side, and then the demonized bad people on the other side of history. But that everyone's now participating in a vortex of history. If you put those filters on, a lot of subjects, a lot of topics fall away, and you're left with a smaller set of stories. And those stories are remarkably elusive to find, actually, that are sustainable for more than a few minutes. And actually, uh, before we go to you, I'd like to take that topic and a little bit further because I mentioned earlier that I was impressed with how some of the films that are coming out recently or dealing with small pockets of history as compared to sweeping um, surveys or theses or anything like that. Uh, how do you see this in the future? Do you feel that's the direction we're going and have we told these stories so many times that the only thing we can do now is find those much more minute subject matter within the larger story? I'll just, uh, I'm interested in your viewpoints. Your this is directly related to my job, <laughs> so yeah. I, I'll just jump in. Um, you know, what, when I joined the American Experience 17 years ago, the, the culture that I walked into was sort of loosely defined as we want to focus on narrow and deep. So I don't think of it as being micro. I think of it as being narrow and deep, and that the narrow and deep can sometimes reveal more than the broad and shallow. Um, that said, so most of our films sort of um, gravitate towards the specific moment, the specific character, the specific summer, not, the, not um, yet, yet, right now I'm developing a four-hour miniseries on the Gilded Age, which is going to be very big and sweeping, which I think also has legitimate mm -hmm. um, role to play because it actually aggregates a bunch of specific stories. And the trick there will be to not make it feel like seventh grade history, yeah. where in that chapter in the, in the book that was on the Gilded Age with the robber barons and the railroads and the blah, 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 and. So how, do you do, <laughs> how, how, would, you, how would you say you're going, what's your approach to avoid We're that? We're going to create a series of specific deep Okay. moments in it with specific characters, a small cast, small number of events, and we're going to leap across time from event to event. Sounds great. I, I think in a way um, wh what we're all talking about is it's not information, it's narrative. What is the story? Who are the That's characters? Right. Are they compelling? Um, and so, you know, when I, when I said earlier about biography, our lives don't have that narrative arc. It's very hard to do a great biography, even in Hollywood. What, yeah. like, even Ray, when it came out, had three endings, you know, right. the, it right. doesn't fit. <laughs> but there can be a moment in somebody's life or a moment in the history of a war that really resonates, that has a really clean beginning, middle, end, has great characters, and says so much about the bigger picture. It's what you're referring yeah, to, no, the going deep. I think you're yeah. exactly right. I think the, I mean, it's, it's um, blasphemous to say, but information is the curse of historical filmmaking. Isn't that crazy? But it's um, true. It, <laughs> ha it, it has to be, you know, wrapped in chocolate of narrative. I mean, it, it, it just, and, or else it just doesn't, doesn't work in that medium. And that's sometimes the rub with historians. Um, sorry to the historian yeah. in the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> 
but that because uh, you know, the, and and people, and also you know, for instance, working with let's say Angela Davis or Shirley Chisholm, they get attached to certain people or moments or whatever that are important to them in how they see their lives, but aren't necessarily the best way to convey the overarching story to a broader audience. You know, sometimes you get lucky because the film I made a few years ago called The Loving Story dealt with the, the subject of this interracial couple who got married in the late 50s, got arrested, thrown into jail, banished from the state of Virginia for 25 years, took their case to the Supreme Court, overturned all the, all the anti-miscegenation statutes in the country. So it was a perfect arc. I mean, there was a story arc that was, you know, if you, if, if you, if you tried to think it up, you couldn't have come up with a better one. Um, and fortunately, we found the footage to support it, and so the film got made. Very soon after, we began work on a narrative version of this. And so even with this perfect story arc, we knew we had to zoom in on a piece of it, partly because we'd already told it in the documentary, but also people found themselves fascinated not with the fact that they overturned the law, which is in the history books and taught in law schools, but how is it these two people came together and fell in love in the first place? So the narrative really focuses more on their love story and the community that, that fostered this kind of love that made it possible. So I think that there are a lot of answers to this question and there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. And I think that that's where the individual filmmaker really comes into play because it's the thing that you connect to and the way you see the, st it, it is story. Shala, you're, I mean, 100% agree with you that in both documentary and narrative it is about story and it's the one that's going to give you that chill and make you decide you want to make the movie. I mean one of the things about making the film about the summer of 64 is you'd be talking with people and they'd be telling you this great story and you're like oh that Stanley, the director's gonna love it, I can't wait to yeah. tell them and then they'll be like yeah you know that was in 65. <laughs> or, oh yeah, that was, you know, in October of 64. And, you know, it was a great story, but it yeah. didn't fit our framework. So in some ways, you know, our narrow story, I mean, I'm just saying that not everything fits within the narrow, deep story. There's a lot of other great stories that, um, you know, you. I, I wish that we were doing a companion book when we made the film. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's when you record the story and then deposit it at the Schomburg? Yeah. <laughs> for all the future historians. Will right, the Schomburg right. be giving us the money <laughs> to record those additional stories? Whoops. Let's well, we talk, but you know. <laughs> it's an extra, extra in a DVD, right? Just don't let it go. <laughs> um, any other questions? There must be some. Is there anything else that you feel like talking about? I mean, this is a well, wonderful I'll subject. Just, I'll just pick up one uh, seed that you sort of planted at the beginning, which is um, there is, it, there's a, I think, a real dynamism right now in historical filmmaking. I actually, it's not really about the type of film that we've been talking about, as good as they are. Um, there have been great archival, witness-driven films made for a number of decades now, and there's continuing to be great ones made, including by these two great filmmakers right here. Um, for me, the more interesting area right now is, if you've noticed over the last 10, 15 years, you've noticed a, a lot of feature films are borrowing from historical um, documentary films, using footage um, in, in quite liberally. And, also, and the number of times that you see based on a true story at the beginning of a, of a film, there's this hunger for authenticity in Hollywood. Be, as I think we've you know, entered a, a harder and harder realm of what's real, what's not real, Hollywood is gauged that there's a, a, a value, an added value in the authentic. So they've been borrowing from us for many years. Now, we've, as a, in, as a genre, have been started to borrow from them. And I think we've borrowed narrative techniques, and we now are producing at least once a year a film that has scripted dialogue in it and still calling it a historical documentary. It'll have interviews, it'll have archival footage, and it'll also have scripted scenes. Now those scripted scenes oftentimes depart from the known historical record. We try to keep them within the, um, the likely. We try not to introduce you know, information, or not information, but, but um, plot points that in a way are transcend history, but that help 
draw us closer to it. And the, and the reason to do it is not simply to, to try to join the feature film bandwagon, but it's only, it's way for some stories to be told because most stories are not documented. Most people's stories are not documented. So how do you do an old story from the 17th century? How do you do a story about a person or a place that, that never saw a film cameraman come down from a network? How do you do those stories? You have to create your own imagery, or you, and you have to create your own imaginative world. And one of the ways you can do it is to, is to borrow some of the techniques. And it's, it's a dynamic moment right now about what constitutes the borderline between historical documentary and the realm of the imagination in fiction. And it's a, it's a very dynamic area. Oh, I, well, I have a question, actually, for you about that. About that. So what does that do to the budget? How do you, uh, how do you conceive of it then? Um, and when does it, cro and then separate from that, when does it cross the line into basically not, not doc? I don't know I, yet. I'm the f yeah. Well, I mean, we, d we did um, a three-hour series on the abolitionists, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. I f felt was a really important story to tell. And um, it's the bulk of the story is pre-photographic history. Um, and we could have, you know, belabored the, the, s the half a dozen photos of Frederick Douglass and yeah. And Harriet Beecher Stowe looking up from, you know, um, and it in could have just would have gone, yeah, in and out and move it sideways and colorize it, and it just would have gone, you know. And instead, we, you know, we mustered the resources, and it's not easy, yeah. and it's expensive to do it. And at, at the end of the day, we had, you know, a, a group of academic historians who were shepherding this all the way through because it was partially funded by the NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities. And I kept asking this question are, have, are we going over a line here where we're inventing, not rec in a way sort of reproducing? And they and they they were actually more willing to have us go in that space than we were. The idea of historical imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to t I like to talk about that. Even when we're using the found um, um, bits of footage that to put it together in a way that creates a historical verite that allows somebody watching it to feel like they're there. And so I think that if it kind of con if it's confined to that, whatever it may be, whether it's created images or not, it can be very satisfying. I did for the first time um, recreations for Free Angela, and I was really nervous. I told everybody that if they sucked, they were not going to be in the final film, and they had to be aware of that from mm -hmm. the DP on down. Um, but it was really interesting when the film got out into the world. And I think Kathleen Cleaver, who's a very famous Black Panther, was not part of this story. But she was like, that footage that you found, the silhouettes of Angela, was really, and I know that they're not real, <laughs> but they re but the, it just so, yes. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. the, the, so the people that lived it, I, I mean, it, it's a story where there are people, people who right. still live the moment could feel like if it was authentic emotionally, right? They knew that it wasn't actual, um, but it could, if it could be authentic emotionally, and so that's where the movie making comes in. We are mo we are making movies. Well, they are not that's just That's right. History. I mean, it's a historical imagination is a wonderful term, and, and there's another way of saying it in a, in a broader way, and that is point of view. I mean, a, a filmmaker is bringing their point of view to that story. And um, sometimes that point of view may be questioned by the audience, but there's no way that this is going to be a totally objective piece of history like a textbook. And sometimes you will, for instance, even if you're not reinventing, but you're streaming together footage, or in my case, I use very often photographs that become montage. And, and, and I've, I've placed them in a way in footage and footage into montage, which, which delivers another piece of the story. Um, and that's my imagination that's gone into it. And it's my way of saying, this is the way I feel about this event, and I hope you will feel the same way. But um, I, I think that in a way we're all using our historical imagination when we're making our films. Well, it's interesting to me that um, the history of documentary is roughly 100 years old, um, a little bit longer than that, 120 years old. And the, the roots of documentary film are in recreation. Nanook of the North yeah. is a giant right. recreation. Of course, of course. The Great Train Robbery, which is one of the very first films, is half recreation, half not recreation. Those famous footage that we've all seen of the troops coming out of the trenches in World War I, recreation. 
not real, recreation. So, and, and throughout the 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, the freedom and the, and the fluidity between the, the real and the approximated was, was very dynamic. Then we hit this, I think, sort of an aberration period of hyper journalism with the cinema verite movement in the 1960s where the fly on the wall became the standard. We're, we're not going to touch the subject. We're just going to observe. We're not going to meddle. And of course, that was based on a false pretense that, that, that you, that you always don't change. Meddling. The, yeah. you, that you don't change the situation. And I think we're finally now crawling out from under that journalistic burden on our shoulders. And, I, and you know, it's, it's hard, though, because you feel like you're violating some standard, some stricture that you're supposed to follow. But, we're returning to what documentary was, which was an art form to begin with, and that's what it, I think it should be. That's really well put. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, also an academic historian and truly object to the idea that textbooks are objective. They also have okay. a point of view. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Stan just corrected. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, <laughs> And um, coming at it from a slightly different angle, though, I teach at a liberal arts college, and so we're developing programming that heads in the documentary studies uh, tradition and really interested in, as historians, we've opened up recently to visual, we've opened up recently to public history on a whole bunch of levels, but at, a, at an academic setting in a, in a liberal arts college or an academic institution, where would you see documentary and history coming together? Is there a place? It, have you noticed as documentary historians, undergraduates getting involved, graduates reaching out, the institutions of academia turning to you again a little bit more? Um, in a friendly fashion, not just to collaborate on research, but to collaborate in creating a next generation of documentarians. Wow. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but I will say this, that for every one of the films that I make, I get emails from college kids and um, high school students. I got an email from a high school student recently about the Shirley Chisholm film. She was like, I absolutely had no idea that Shirley Chisholm, about Shirley Chisholm and the fact that she ran for president. And I, when I watched the film, I could see her do it, you know? And she was really excited. High school, high school. So that there is, I mean, what I like is that audiovisual material really can help with historical imagination for, for younger people. And we get called all the time to go, to, to go um, show our films at various schools and engage with students. And usually the people that invite us um, are from the history department, women's that like it's a conglomerate of people, not just film divisions. And in fact, a lot of film divisions don't even have documentary departments. You know, I've sold the documentary departments are in the journalism yeah. schools. <laughs> I, I've sold the loving story to hundreds of thousands of universities, schools, and libraries. Um, and I find it ironic because, you know, I'm sorry I, I said what I said about textbooks, but think about what we used to say about documentaries. It was the medicinal, it was the D word, and it's because we grew up watching them in schools and they were, they seemed at the time deadly dull. They, we were being force fed them. And now, because documentary, the, the genre has just gotten so lively and so vibrant, and there is the imagination that's, that's, that's infused it as compared to just laying out the story. Um, now schools want them back, which I think is just so healthy, and it's, it's, if anything is gonna uh, con continue to underwrite the documentary form, it's the educational market. So I guess I was asking not so much about showing documentary, but making documentary in an, in an educational setting. And like, would it fit in a history department in your perspective? Not just writing papers, your students, but if they're doing public history, creating exhibits, making film. I think so. I absolutely think I think so. it'd be great. I mean, yeah. wh well, I mean why, why not? As an independent, like an independent project for a semester to have grad students and send them out, and this is our topic. We're going to research yeah. the heck out of it. What do we bring together? What are we going to make out of it? I think that would be a great tutorial. And filmmakers who work on projects for year after year after year right. would would love that independent. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and, and you know, so many so many high schools have great visual studies um, departments, and there's I can see a crossover so beautifully. You know, they they're learning how to do it anyway. So here's a great application for it. I also, as documentary filmmakers, we use a lot of interns. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that would be another place for college students to perhaps uh, participate in the making of a documentary. I'll just add that I think some school, maybe liberal arts college, is, is going to figure out that there's a really dynamic study area right now, which is the difference between documentary and reality. And uh, because I think right now we're 
training a generation in with reality programming that ha that is used to um, an artificial world where human behavior looks natural as being the actual world. And you know, there's some legitimacy to that. I mean, it's you know, that's what plays are about in a, in a way, and that's what um, feature films are about. But I think you know, to actually give an assignment to make a reality show um, based on a, a certain idea, and then make a documentary and tease out the differences, I think would be a fascinating reveal on the differences. Yes, sir. Oh, well, to, your, to your first question about the reality shows, because you're here at the uh, in the neighborhood where they film lizard lick towing a reality show. And I think you almost more complicated having people figure out the difference between a reality show and a sitcom. Because that's what they really, they're sitcoms without timing, without having to have comic appeal or anything. But uh, th so it's more than more than documentary they share. Um, my, my question though is about uh, YouTube and how it's opened up historical footage that people have really never been able to get a hold of. It, just curiosity seekers and people, I guess, who couldn't afford getting into the documentaries and somehow it's it slides on YouTube and you're sitting there and somebody shows you a clip and you're like, well, I haven't se I ever seen you know this this performance or this interview. They had uh, you know, famous ones, I guess, is Sir Serge Gainsbourg with Whitney Houston where he said something outrageous. And you know, VH1 isn't gonna show that. So it's like, how, how has it allowed you as a documentarian, has there been points where you look on YouTube and you find something and you go, how can I find this, where can I find this back where it's been placed off, you know, almost outlaw like on the internet? I, I found some of my first footage on YouTube. Um, I know that it's only the beginning and I know I can't really use it. First of all, I can't license it without finding the, the source, but also it's usually in pretty bad condition, so that's gonna have to be improved. But when I was, when I found the story that is showing in an hour or so here, the afternoon of a fawn, um, the first thing I did was go to YouTube and found some images of, of some footage of this dancer dancing, and um, I fell in love with her as a result, so I'm very grateful. Um, and every once in a while, I'll go back to it and say, gee, I wonder if this ever appeared, or something like that. So it's a great first step. It's a great first resource. Um, that's my experience. And I, I, I like YouTube for finding what other commercial works were made before whatever I'm thinking of, um, you know, and IMDb. It gives you a sense, but on YouTube you can usually see a clip, or sometimes you can see the whole film if it's a very old film, um, and so I, I yeah. enjoyed that aspect of it. But it's a tool. It's it's not um, a ha an aha. Yeah. Well, I think we've explored some really interesting subject matter, and I'm sorry that we don't have more time to talk about some of the things that came up, like for fair use, and the I think Mark's, Mark's um, discussion of hybrid filmmaking and the use of reenactment is also another whole panel in itself. So I hope you'll come back to full frame um, next year, and maybe that will be on the schedule. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.